Hello and welcome to Climb's podcast series, Advancing Vietnam, with me, Vlad Savin, as your host. In this episode, I'm discussing with Matthew Lowry, managing partner at Climb Vietnam, about successful investors in Vietnam and how they undertake business operations, looking at their mindset and best practices. Matthew, welcome again to our Advancing Vietnam podcast series. Well, it's great to be here with you today. In this special episode, we won't look at specifically at the topic on regulations or on specific technicalities about business in Vietnam, but instead we'll try to understand the mindset, best practices, and how successful investors think and undertake operations in Vietnam. Let's try to identify some of the key traits that represent them. To narrow down the discussion, let's look at the key points and I identified seven areas, seven actions that uh, okay. successful investors, based on our experience, yours more than mine, you've been here almost 20 years so, already. So only seven? We're seven? Only seven just for this episode. Okay. Let's see Perfect. in the next one. <laughs> um, let's start with the first one. Successful investors don't create false uh, wishful expectations from the outset and they're uh, re ready to adapt fast in the market. Um, what does this mean in practice? Um, it, if you start your business in Vietnam, do it the right way. And it's just expectations in Vietnam that it's easy. It doesn't match with international practice. Um, so doing it the right way is really stopping, slowing down, learning what to do, and don't assume what you've learned in another jurisdiction applies. Um, we see this regularly with, with um, people coming in, um, applying common law concepts, applying company concepts. So that catches people out. And that applies from everything about how you bring your money in, that applies with obligations on accounting, reporting, and it's just set back and, and think differently. Um, that in, you know, getting advice, understanding structure. So Vietnam's a process-based, what is the process? It's not a, sorry, it's, um, it's a rules base. What is the rules? It's not just a general, what is the process? You have to understand the rules. So to, so to answer that question, it's a very broad um, opening question, is about remove what you've learned in the past and be completely honest about um, what, it needs, what you need to do in a regulatory sense and difference in Vietnam. Just to contrast that, what happens when things go wrong is people come in who are successful business people push ahead and do things their way and get caught out because, oh, I didn't understand, I didn't expect that. <laughs> and that'll come through on you know, tax inspection or come through where it blows up. And we see that where you know, the, a great business is destroyed because someone didn't understand what the rules and what they had to do and to make sure that they, things worked. The second area where uh, we observe the investors um, uh, undertake operations successfully on the long term is where they stay out of the convoluted, opaque uh, business environment, the local type of um, uh, business mindset that e exists here, and they, um, they are able to maintain their business practices at a high level. The, the um, oh, I've got a friend who can help out. I've, I know someone who knows someone who can do it the local way. Yeah, we you hear that a lot. So the best way is to um, not be part of that. And it's I, I learned um, many years ago was keep your standards high, never lower them. Bring people to the international expectations. Do things, follow the law, and just be comfortable with that as the right way to go about it. Um, again, you see people get caught out is when they know someone who knows someone. They think there's a local way. They want to pay off the authorities mm -hmm. to expedite something. Thing. All of those are a trap. So this paying people off, okay, there's, a, there's an element of corruption built into Vietnamese society that's being, it's being eroded over time, um, but that's a short term and it will come back to bite you because then there's an expectation that'll keep happening and you can't run a business knowing there's a fear and expectation. Um, we also find that if people, um, oh, I've got a contact, I've got a connection, they change jobs, people change, and it's not going to be there and that'll catch you out if you rely upon it. And so the local way is, um, it may be an experience that someone has achieved, oh, there's a way to do it. It will catch you out. So long-term successful businesses, doing it properly, understanding what's correct and not falling into that localization trap. Um, and just to, um, to finalize that, train your staff at those higher standards. And if you've got your staff working at those standards, they'll bring you up and then you can be, uh, long-term successful because your staff make you long-term successful. And we know quite a few examples of uh, investors that for two, three years, they've done business the local way. They were trying to figure out uh, understanding the market and the regulations. And then they came back and they said, 
please help us. We want to do it right. How are we going to do it? Uh, and a lot of the times it's almost <coughs> but you're back to the um, point zero and it costs you so much more. So you see tax inspections of someone who's taken that approach and the implications when they get a tax inspection, which is when they come to us, is it, the, the penalties and the issues arising are greater than anything they've done today. <coughs> it's destroyed all the value of the business. We see that regularly. So um, it is much cheaper um, financially to do it properly at the start than to try to rectify three years of incorrect activities. Another key area that we observe with the successful investors on the long term is their uh, very practical understanding of the capital, capital flow uh, within the, the Vietnamese structures, which means getting the money in, getting the money out, and really understanding the practicalities, the conditions, and potential restrictions, which are actually not that many, but just having an understanding on that process is important. Yeah, it's very specific requirements for foreign investors of how you bring your money in and then how you get it back out. So it's one party's bringing it in the right way via a special bank account, and that's your flow of funds. You, that's the people often ask, how do you get money out of Vietnam? Well, bring it in properly, you can take it out properly, take your profits back out. Where you don't bring it in properly, it's trap funds. And if you use nominee structures and others, that can be double trap funds. You can actually have to bring more money in and it can cause significant problems. And it, um, more importantly, if you don't bring the money in that you've committed, do we see people put down um, the historical practice in Vietnam probably um, allowed this, but, um, but we see people put a huge amount of money as their committed capital on their investment application. You have to bring that in. You've got commitments and in most cases that's 90 days. And if you don't, your company's you know, um, completely, completely um, broken effectively. You can't necessarily sell it because you can't confirm that you've made your capital commitments. Your capital account may not even be able to bring in <coughs> loans or pay out dividends. And therefore, the, it is really a broken system. And that comes down to relying on people who may have only worked in the local space because it, this applies to foreign investors. It's a foreign, capital accounts are a foreign investor situation. So if you've got individuals, if you're getting advice from one a, um, a Vietnamese um, staff or something about it. It's all right, it's all right, this is how everyone does it. That's going to catch you out. You need that international cross-border experience into Vietnam to make sure you meet those capital commitments. If you get that right, money flows. We don't have trap funds in Vietnam as a general rule if you use those accounts, and then you can do your dividends, you can sell your company, you can, you can operate and do everything you want to do without fear. Another common example is the loans um, uh, funding within the company. Can you share a few uh, thoughts on a potentially case study that you experienced with uh, incorrect uh, loan injection? So you've got a few parts of that. One is where people bring loans, just send it to a friend, where they send loans to the company's operating account. Um, and both, those, both of those examples mean that those are either stuck in country or will be deemed to be revenue in some cases. So we have seen situations where money came in incorrectly deemed to be revenue because you can't show it was legitimate loan because it didn't go through this foreign loan account if it come from abroad. You've got to go through a capital account or a loan account. So if you don't do it properly, you could actually, your own money can be, can you can pay profits tax on your own money coming in because you just didn't put it in properly. We have seen that, we've seen the authorities, they're quite aggressive. The other part, if you bring money in and you don't register at the state bank or you don't follow the requirements, again, you can have trapped funds because of a simple, oh, I didn't bother doing it, I didn't know I had to, you can get caught out. So the fact that the state bank won't register you and then fine you for not registering or fine you for incorrect um, use of funds. So that's significant fines from state bank or tax penalties and assessment as revenue. We see both. Um, and in fact, you could have both at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's a multitude of um, issues arising just for a small, oh, I used the wrong bank account or I sent it to a friend because I was told that's okay. You can come up with significant problems. And when you're actually um, not looking at the transfer funds and you're not making the right bank accounts choices, what happens with the trap funds? Is there any easy solution, any choice, or that's one of the critical areas that cannot be solved. Um, you can't repatriate a loan if the loan wasn't brought in properly. So that, that, so fundamentally your, your funds are trapped. So then you've got to work out, well, can I, I, if my capital account's not done properly, I, maybe I can't even send my, I can't pay a dividend back out. So I might have to pay tax on it, it's stuck here. I might have to pay a service charge. I may have to try to do something else. There's no good solution. And mm -hmm. um, it just goes, it's again, it's a spiral. You, you can work out, you can recapitalize. There are ways around that potentially, but you're, you're starting from a pain point and an expensive exercise to correct. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before about <clears throat> nominee structures, uh, moving forward to the fourth uh, uh, important action that a successful investor takes uh, take in Vietnam is 
their choices within the market entry, their choices on the structure and how they actually enter the market, either a new company, either buying a company or potentially a nominee structure. What do you see common for successful investors when they're looking at the market entry process? To answer that, a few different parts to answer that is that, first of all, nominees are not legal under Vietnamese law. So there is um, there's provisions that state that they can be removed if there's uh, cases. So they're not they're not part of Vietnamese law. So anything, it's, there's there's a flat red flag on that in the first place. Um, we all also see common advice that um, it's easier and faster for an ex, um, for a foreign investor to set up a local company and then buy the shares. Um, it doesn't actually save anything. It's still an M and A approval process. Um, in fact, it's got more flaws because the initial investor must capitalise, must bring the money in. If you're using that person as a nominee and your money coming in, back to the first, the previous point, the trap capital when you actually have to acquire. There is no benefit in doing that. So, using an individual to buy the company, set up a company, and then doing it, it may establish the company quicker, but it will not. It will make the ownership process longer and more costly uh, to do that, to go through the process of converting. It is easy to do foreign from the start. And you don't have trapped funds. If the intent is to use it under a local's name just because it's easier, um, keep in mind that that local is the owner, that local, the individual. So if that company has value, if there's value being created, it's their business. I saw one example many years ago where a professional services firm had done that, set it up through an individual that believed that was easier. The individual, when they went to sell it to a third party, requested a significant seven-figure number to, for them to release and sell because it was their, their name on paper and Vietnamese registration, it was theirs. And for them to transact that company, they requested seven figures and got it as part of a transaction for that professional services firm to be acquired. And that was many years ago, um, and that I'm not even sure if that business is still around today, um, but that the value that had been created was through a nominee structure, completely decimated the, um, the founder of that particular business because it wasn't worth um, a huge amount of money, but that, particularly when you take that seven figure number out. And they're the problems that you face with nominees is that the legal base is quite restricted in Vietnam. There are ways to do structures that enable you to work around um, restrictions, but you've got to be careful. They've got to become at an off store level. They've got to involve things that do not breach the law. And that's where you need proper advice about making sure that things are done in the correct way. And when you're buying that specific company, just because it has a license that it allows you to pass over certain restrictions, um, investors also need to understand the past of that company, the compliance, what has been done, uh, and ensuring that there is that risk assessment and they're comfortable with it when doing so. Yeah, so the, I would never be buying an existing company in Vietnam unless I have done my extreme due diligence. Um, the, it is very uncommon to buy a shelf company or it is also quite common buying an existing business to start a new company and acquire the assets and transfer. Um, restricted licenses or where <coughs> the licenses may not be available in the future, you might tra transact that company. But as you say, you can't indemnify against history. So the legal representative at the time is responsible for everything that's happened in the past. And that um, you can go back 10 years or potentially longer about everything. So unless you have complete certainty and comfort, you've done your, your financial due diligence, you've done your tax due diligence um, in play, you, and you've got particular protections, it's very hard to acquire. So those who buy a shell company whereby it's, um, it's someone, oh, this is a someone's old company. We, mm -hmm. I'll give an example. Someone bought a company that had, um, was, had been wound down or was no longer trading. It, a foreign bought it from a local thinking, oh, we've got an empty company. Easy, we can start trading. It had four years of trading history and they were turning over many millions of dollars um, in, in activities. And on tax inspection, <coughs> the tax inspection goes through the record. So that individual is no longer part of the, the Vietnamese individual. They go, oh, we've got all the accounting records. You're now liable for those accounting records. You're liable for the tax implications of them. And you can't defend what happened because you were not part of any history. So you've got no connection to the history. You've got no justification. So the tax authority sitting there just go, basically they can put anything, question, and you've got no defence. And that makes a very small business that these expats set up extremely exposed to a significant problem. Now, even if the individual supported that sold you that business, you are still liable for their actions and trying to get compensa compensation from a party who has sold you a business is a very difficult, nigh on impossible task unless you are very careful um, in that process. So to come back, the best practice here is 
um, a new company, establish a new company, acquiring the assets of a business is the most practical way. You can acquire an existing business if it's, if it's appropriate, do your due diligence and financial tax legal, make sure that that is done to protect and in those circumstances you can be okay. But I, I would definitely, um, someone who either sets up in a nominee name or a local name and transfers, but or buys, I've got a shelf company, it's traded but it hasn't traded recently, uh, it's all good. Um, even with a tax inspection, recent inspection, it still exposes you completely. Another area, area we observe um, international investors having a successful mindset within the, the corporate governance in Vietnam is that they do not fight the system. Uh, bureaucratic as it is, uh, convoluted, significant regulations and frameworks around many separate laws that don't talk to each other. But in the same time, they're able to, to be lean, to have that lean approach, to navigate through the system without fighting against it. Yeah. Uh, in, within this process, they also learn and understand about the system and how to actually work with it. What's your experience uh, with this? Yeah, no, good point. So successful businesses just go, this is what we have to do, let's do it. What's the best way to do it? And that comes down to having your compliance calendar, understanding your obligations, understanding dates and making sure you're meeting those. Um, and that mindset of, I just got to do it, I've just got to comply. There's a cost. It's different to my home country. And Vietnam is very different with its obligations, very accounting obligations, it's a tax accounting system, so there's obligations. Um, so we've got, to, you know, as we go through um, and advise clients, if they're reluctant, we pull them aside and say, look, you've got to be very careful here. Um, there are certain nationalities that really want and try to squeeze things to fit into their mindset, to fit into their approach. And they struggle, to be honest. There's a few of them, I won't name them, but a few nationalities really struggle because the Vietnamese process will not adapt to a foreign process. So as you said, Ted, successful is, um, is accepting that Vietnamese requirements, understanding what it is, and having a plan to complete that. Either outsource, get the right staff, but map it, understand it, and complete it. As soon as you go, can we do something different? Can we not do that? Can we force this? Can we do this instead? Every time you're not following the rules, and Vietnam is a rules base, it's what, one, two, three, four, this is what you need to do. Um, so to follow those rules, to follow the requirements is a necessity, and there's no way around that. Um, and, and, and examples where we have seen people fail is where um, headquarters um, require something in a certain way, and they don't accept and they don't want to lodge the Vietnamese way. They don't want to do the requirements. They want to do all the accounting in English from broad foreign international accounting. Um, you may be able to back, do backwards all the Vietnamese accounting for that year and who knows whether your, your lodgements have been correct during the year because your quarterly lodgements, everything may be incorrect. But the significant cost of going back and doing all is just unnecessary and not, necess not going to be compliant or correct in the end of the day. So just do it properly, don't fight the system, accept that it's different and learn how to, in a lean way, follow the process and get things done is the, is the least pain and the highest benefit for everyone. From a risk perspective, we understand, we observe that the successful international investors, they cannot rely on one single individual, on one person that will help them within the market. They have that understanding that people are indeed the greatest asset of the company, but in the same time, they don't rely on one key individual. What's your experience with that? Um, what may be the biggest takeaway from this, this session today, the individual risk is significant for a range of reasons. One is one person does know everything and one person may not keep up with the laws. If you're relying upon, I have a chief accountant and Vietnamese companies need a chief accountant. The chief accountant qualification is a certification. It requires no continual education. They may not be up to date with current laws. So the advice you're being given may be done in good faith, but not accurate. So we see that, so you want a point where there's someone else testing and someone else sharing knowledge. The second one is that self-review. You can't review your own work and we have a constant reliance, we see it regularly in Vietnam where people rely upon an individual and no one's checking what they're doing. And they make mistakes. People, humans, make mistakes. You cannot have self-review. So oh, I'll, I'll do my own accounting and I've got someone who's great and they'll give me all my legal advice and look after me is a recipe for disaster because that individual. And we have seen examples where that individual then leaves, has a falling out with the, with the owners. Maybe the owners are fighting the process and don't want to follow the rules, um, but that person leaves. And then there's a huge hole because quite often that person just takes everything that's been relied upon and there's nothing. And we have seen that having to recreate 
everything backwards for a number of years because individuals have left, including recreating payroll records. There's no copies of lodgements because that person's left. Now, whether the individual was incompetent, whether the individual was uh, you know, just fail because of the, the self-review process, and you can't do self-review, whether the individual wasn't up to date. It doesn't matter. The risks of that person leaving, again, in that situation was just the cost was immense. And so, um, so the end of the day, um, in any country, this is wrong. And in Vietnam, it's just amplified of the implications of relying upon an individual. So you must have a review process, you must have oversight, you must have multiple points of expertise and contact, and you must make sure that, that if an individual leaves, that the process that you have internally protects against that individual and that, um, <coughs> you know, that, that the risk of that party. Mm -hmm. And with that protection mindset, moving towards uh, the last point that we identified is that successful investors, they are always looking at experts in the market and they're always looking for advice from those specific experts. They don't have the mindset that I know it all and I can do it by myself. They understand that actually they don't know much at all, especially when entering the market here and they're looking for that advice from, from experts with that practical expertise in, in country. And this probably wraps up very well that sort of all of those elements is that um, you do need advice, you need expertise, you need hand-holding. New entry to market or even existing been here a long mm. time. Uh, Vietnam is an, is an opaque market, the rules are opaque. Having someone with experience to guide you, and it may be that you have a team and there's a slight, there's a le level of review over top. It means that when you're coming in, getting that advice in the first case from someone and getting advice from multiple sources, comparing that advice. So just, yeah, just make, ensuring that, that um, professional advice, that guidance, and the ongoing third party <coughs> external, not just keeping it there. So from a Vietnamese point of view, it is common traditionally to have key individuals inside the business, not to use external advisors, to rely upon that internal. And that has a, there, there is a benefit to that. But the best success we see and in international practice is have your external advisors, external counsel, external advice at the start and on the way through. How you structure that is very open. There's lots of ways to structure it, but having that reliance so that you enter correctly, set up correctly, transact correctly, and during the years and as you operate that everything is protected and working as expected so you're not getting um, surprises at the end of the day because it's those surprises, as we've said a few times, that cost. And correcting something in the past will cost significantly more than it will be just to get it right in the first place. And to finalize as well, international investors, they actually don't get many surprises because their expectations are um, tailored and adjusted to the culture and business environment in Vietnam. The surprises they get are essentially menial comparison with uh, the, the significant other areas that may touch oh, them. Oh, just to clarify, in international investors who do it properly from the start don't get many surprises. Yeah. We do see international investors with surprises and those are ones who don't follow those rules. So those seven rules that you've gone through there, I think there were seven counted, um, people who follow those, yeah, they, they actually don't. They just, then they, you will, everyone in Vietnam gets tax inspected. Just do it, it's a process. It's not a fear. Um, there are requirements. You just meet those requirements. You plan for it, you don't fight them. You set up the company right, you bring your money in right, you operate correctly. It just happens. There are always surprises, um, but they're not things that would damage the business, and that's it. So I segregate into inv international investors who do it correctly, and international investors who try to do it and t um, cut corners and do it other ways and listen for all those other things we've talked about, th th they do suffer. So it's two, <coughs> two different bundles there. We want to see people that are successful because it's a great country, there's lots of opportunities. So doing it right can, can be very rewarding. Matthew, thank you again for your practical insights. Always great to talk, Vlad. Experienced investors know that doing business in a complex market such as Vietnam, such as Vietnam poses challenges, risks, but also offers significant rewards. Seeking to understand the market, learn from experts and their experience is critical for international investors to not get caught up in the convoluted regulatory environment and the grey areas that exist. And many thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in to the Advancing Vietnam podcast series. For more information about this topic, please check out our publications on vietnam.backline.com. And if you want to reach out to us for any additional details, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or throughout the website contact details.